PhD student in linguistics at the University of Hawaii, and I am the liaison for this workshop. Um, so I'm happy to introduce Pier Paolo Di Carlo and uh, Rachel Ayu Ayuk Ojongjiba is the other presenter for this workshop, but she is having some technical difficulties right now, but hopefully she'll be joining us shortly. Um, I've had the pleasure of collaborating with Pier Paolo before on the Viral Languages Project, which we talk about. There's a couple other presentations about that in this uh, conference, but Pier Paolo is a postdoctoral associate at the University of Buffalo, and he's uh, the project coordinator on a couple of projects like the key pluridisciplinary advances on African multilingualism in Cameroon project, which uh, Rachel has also been working on for several years, and also the socio-spatial approaches to the analysis of multilingualism project. Um, and I'm really excited to be the liaison for this workshop because I have been working with Bradley McDonald in a multilingual community in Sumatra for um, a couple of years, and I'm really excited to learn about the the ideas and methods behind documenting multilingualism. So um, just at the start here, I'm going to launch this poll for everyone. So if you just want to fill it out over the first few minutes of the workshop, um, and I'll turn it over to Pier Paolo. Mahalo. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jacob. And uh, thanks everyone for being here, for your interest in this workshop. I hope Rachel, in the meantime, was able to connect. I can barely see her anyway. I hope she will manage. She's connected directly from, from Buea, <clears throat> Southwest region of Cameroon. And we'll see. Okay, so while you um, answer the poll, is the poll over, Jacob? It's still open. Um, it's still I'm, open. Yeah, I'm just leaving it open until more people can answer. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, when we were uh, talking about uh, how to introduce us in, uh, in this uh, workshop. My main uh, concern uh, that, that I uh, told to Jacob was to uh, make sure that people knew a little bit of what uh, Rachel and I did, because uh, this is a new domain in, uh, in language documentation. And so it may, since there is still not too much uh, published, uh, it may seem some kind of personal curiosity. But in fact, uh, I mean, small scale multilingualism is very much uh, diffused. The more we, we work, not only uh, us, the, the more other researchers work, and the more we find out that uh, it's a very pervasive phenomenon. And so uh, this is why uh, we'd like to, to talk about uh, how we have uh, dealt with uh, small scale multilingualism from a documentary perspective. So if uh, you, can you, can you end the poll, Jacob? Yep. Um, okay. So I can share the results. Okay. Thanks, Instasia. Thanks for participating. Okay. All right. Thanks, because now we can send the second poll. Uh, which is how many multilingual documentation projects do you know of? <clears throat> so people are filling it up right now. Yeah, I'm seeing. And because there are I mean, for the, the, those I know of are, are rel relatively few and quite recent. And so I was, uh, was curious. Also because, you know, uh, there is one, I'm just sharing with you a, a back-end uh, situation, which is um, having a, a diverse audience, that is what, uh, I mean, the, the, the beauty of ICLDC, 
is uh, can be a, a real um, say challenge for for um, preparing a, a workshop not just a presentation um so this is what i would like to that is why i i would i wanted to know from all of you if you were kind of uh, familiar with the, this kind of works all right Thank you. Then I will probably ask uh, the person who responded uh, that uh, they know many doc multilingual documentation projects to, to probably share some of uh, uh, the, li the literature that uh, he or she knows, because maybe that may, may will, will surely complement my, uh, my knowledge. So I'm going to share the results. Okay, so <clears throat> um, from what I can see, the audience is basically 50 50. <laughs> and so this is not going to be, uh, uh, let's say, a decisive factor for me to, to decide uh, how to cut the presentation. Anyway, I will do it uh, as it comes. Um, so anyway, it's hardly surprising that uh, language documentation corpora are largely mo monolingual, right? Because the multilingualism is in fact um, tightly connected with issues of, of endangerment. Uh, I mean, uh, language shift is possible only when people are at least bilingual <clears throat> in another language and they stop using the, <clears throat> the, the heritage language and shift to the new one. So one may even say that multilingualism is the main threat to language, language maintenance. So why bothering to document multilingualism? Wouldn't this mean supporting the very practices that threaten an endangered language? Well, I would like to invite you to just uh, stop for a second and, and have a self-reflexive moment uh, with me, just to uh, track back where uh, the, the, the model that we normally uh, apply in um, and uh, talking about multilingualism comes from. It comes from the Deglos Deglosia theory uh, or the extended Deglosia theory of uh, Joshua Fishman, um, where uh, so the, the Deglosia theory, the, the basic assumption is that <clears throat> if uh, in a society there are two or more languages that are widely known and are used for internal communication, meaning that uh, choosing one or the other language is always optional, is not um, conditional on understanding. Okay, people can understand each other using both languages, but they uh, select only one or the other. So in this situation, <clears throat> one set of behaviors, attitudes and values supports and is expressed in one language and another set of behaviors, attitudes and values supports and is expressed in another language. This is the main assumption of the Glossia theory. We can represent it this way. So imagine that this is the community language repertoire. So the, the repertoire of the languages that are widely known in the community and have this kind of uh, complementary distribution at the level of uh, use. Um, so it's subdivided into two parts, language A and language B. And Say so. Language A allows uh, A behaviors to take place, A attitudes to manifest, and A values to be say experienced. And same uh, for language B. One very important aspect of diglossia theory is that it posits a hard boundary between languages or codes. Okay, uh, that is something to keep in mind. And little Fishman knew, but uh, because uh, in 1967, uh, 1965, and 1967, <clears throat> we we still didn't have the the term uh, language ideology, but he was modeling a type of language ideology. Uh, so, but a certain kind of uh, language ideology, because uh, you know, the Gossier theory comes with this package. It's not only two languages, but there is a hierarchical arrangement between the two. So there is a high language and a low language. So this means that this models a prestige-based hierarchical language ideology. And of course, I mean, where are uh, 
So is there any human society that is not uh, hierarchical? Uh, of course, uh, unfortunately, I think uh, all our societies have some form of a hierarchy. But what is uh, peculiar to the Gaussian theory is that it was developed, uh, developed by global northerners in uh, mostly urban uh, settings where this uh, hierarchization of languages is especially visible. Um, so what is the next implication of the Glossia theory? Um, to, so the, the, the idea that the sociolinguistic, uh, sociolinguistic space of a certain community, that is the universe of all linguistic practices of a given community, can be subdivided into domains. So domain is a complicated concept. It's not just location. It's not just types of speakers, of interactants, is not just topics, it's a, it's a kind of abstraction from all of these features <clears throat> in such a way as to have, mm, uh, say, mm, groups of features that are internally homogenous and, uh, and are at the same time uh, enough distinct from other groups of features. So in this case, I just put social institutions, education, economy, cult and family, just uh, as a um, as a quick reminder uh, of how many, in fact, domains can be can be uh, identified in a given society. We know that the uh, workplace and the street, the school, the church, or the mosque, or uh, then family and neighbors. Okay, those are domains. And um, so, since we have the so the two languages, so the, the, the model goes, so there is a language ideology through which the speaker selects either the H or the L language in order to communicate properly, quote unquote, I mean, according to uh, the communicative competence and the expectations of the, that are widespread in the society in different domains that are specific to, to the, um, to the language, so that the, the language, uh, each language has its own domains. Okay, this is where we start from. This is what molds our eyes, our mentality towards uh, multilingualism in society. So much more common than two languages only in most post-colonial countries uh, nowadays, we have a, a triglossic uh, configuration where there is so the, the high language is most commonly the ex-colonial language. Then we have a language of wider communication as a, say, meat language, uh, so a lingua franca. And then we have a, a, the low language, also called Basilect, uh, I mean, depending on the, on the traditions of the, of the scholars. Um, in this situation, so what is it that uh, causes endangerment? The fact as we all know, that uh, the H and M language may erode domains of the low language. And this is where the danger comes from. Okay, so this is the basic uh, so framework within, uh, also unknowingly, we, uh, so we think about the relationship between multilingualism and, uh, and language endangerment. But is multilingualism always a threat? Well, even within the, the, fish, so the Fishman's Diglossia theory and the domain model, there is one situation that shouldn't actually be uh, considered a threat to language endangerment, uh, which is the so-called stable multilingualism, which is a situation in which the two, the H and M language are not eroding domains, and so the danger is not there for the Basilect, for the community language. But stable multilingualism is theoretically possible, but until there is a dominant language, how can we really consider the sociolinguistic space to be stable, that is static? I, I mean, I think the, that is, I mean, if there are contexts of, of that kind, uh, please let me know. Because I think there are other types of multilingualism, uh, of multilingualisms that are uh, documented, and that uh, really 
instantiate another uh, situation uh, of between so the, the, that can be uh, uh, seen between multilingualism and endangerment. What is uh, this other form of multilingualism? So this is the model we have just seen with domains and so on and so forth. Imagine that instead of having just one basilect, one low language, a person has multiple languages that are found at this end of the domain, uh, I mean, of the language repertoire. And what happens? It happens that all of them are used in this, say, domains. But the very idea of domains kind of explodes here because there is a, an admixture of things. So domains are no longer salient, are no longer significant to understand why people behave in a, in a way or another linguistically. Domains are no longer useful in this kind of uh, uh, multilingualism. Why is that so? Because languages do not pattern, uh, pattern hierarchically. So those languages don't. Maybe those, so the ex-colonial language and the lingua franca may also pattern hierarchically. But the other part of the, of the multilingual repertoire that is widespread among speakers doesn't. And so these are forms that have been called egalitarian, indigenous, traditional, small scale, multilingual. There are many, there is also organic. So there are many labels uh, for this form of uh, multilingualism <clears throat> that, uh, as I said, cannot be fully analyzed in terms of domains of language use. Where are these uh, multilingual forms of multilingualism located? Just to mention those that are more commonly um, cited in the literature. We have Lower Casamance in Senegal. Uh, then there's Lower Fungum in Cameroon. There's Vanuatu. And then there is West Arnhem, Arnhem Land in, uh, in Australia. Then we have the Upper Rio Negro in the Valpes area uh, between Brazil and Colombia and the upper Xingu in, in Brazil. Um, so if we very briefly look at the maps, we can see why these are called small scale multilingualisms. So with the exception, probably the, the partial exception of the upper Rio Negro and Valpes Basin, that is not that small scale, but yet it gives this idea that the extent of the multilingual repertoires of the, of the people um, includes languages that are spoken one, clo one uh, close to the other. So they're all from the same kind of geographic area. This is very clear in places like Lower Fungum, where you have most people who have a multilingual repertoire that never goes uh, so, um, uh, beyond uh, below two languages. So the, the, there are no monolinguals at all. Um, and uh, whenever uh, there are two, more than two languages, uh, there will only be just one language that is an exoglossic language that is uh, Pidgin English. And then all the other languages or lects, meaning that, uh, I mean, I will, I will tell you more about that, um, are only local uh, codes. Uh, and this is the same also in Senegal, in Vanuatu, and also in West Arnhem Land. Here, this, uh, it's kind of uh, interesting. I don't know if Ruth is uh, is here. Uh, I saw she was uh, planning to attend. Um, this is also a very interesting situation where uh, the multilingualism is mostly receptive. And so anyway, uh, so it's also very interesting to see that uh, no matter how similar this, the, 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 the situations, the, these different settings can be because um, they are all in a, in areas that haven't, uh, so they are not urbanized. So there's, these are all rural, say, or uh, say peripheral areas, peripheral to some centers. Um, so, and the, the repertoires are very localized. So these are uh, shared features. But then uh, all the different studies that have tried to understand how multilingualism is really manifested in the different uh, traditions, so to say, uh, 
go into quite different uh, directions. So there are um, points in common, but there is also uh, sheer diversity. So that is this uh, is suggestive of a situation in which we cannot say that small multilingualism is one kind of multilingualism. So there are small scale multilingualisms uh, necessarily. They're all diverse. But uh, there are many other examples. Uh, the, there are examples in Uganda, Northern Cameroon, also in Ghana, in the Caucasus, uh, in Papua New Guinea, uh, the Kamchatka, other places in Siberia. And then there are also, say, remnants or memories of small scale multilingualism also in North America. I am not an expert in this case. So since there are many people from North America who I'm quite sure are, uh, I mean, are an expert or uh, for sure, they know much more than I do about North American uh, traditions of multilingualism. I would be very happy to 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 get their their feedback or I mean their, uh, just some remarks about how common uh, may have been uh, for uh, Native American um, communities to be multilingual in uh, near, uh, neighboring languages uh, in pre-contact uh, situations. Okay, but so one very little uh, remark. Why were all these cases recognized only recently? Well, because it, it took uh, a while for non-sociolinguists to deal with multilingualism, basically. Uh, all the people who, who started uh, mentioning multilingualism, so starting from the very first uh, publications um, about the Valpes in the 60s, uh, by an anthropologist. And then uh, it was, at, at least in African uh, situations, in African settings, it was um, either uh, contact linguists like Friederike Lübke uh, or linguist anthropologists like me, uh, I mean, language documenters. And, uh, and also in Vanuatu, it was Alex Francois, who, who was a linguist. Uh, so people who didn't come with the background of the Deglossia theory. That, is, that was probably key in allowing uh, us to be a bit freer um, in our <laughs> initial ignorance about the gross setting. Um, so, but how does small scale multilingualism pattern with language endangerment? So, what is the, what can we say about multilingualism, small scale multilingualism uh, with regard to endangerment? Well, I have a couple of uh, quotations. <clears throat> so this is from Ruth, Singer, uh, Ruth Singer's work on Warui. So the intensive multilingualism at Warui is neither incidental nor marginal. Multilingualism has not arisen as an accident of people coming together in the post-contact era, and neither does multilingualism exist and at the margins of imagined monolingual groups. Rather, Multilingualism at Warubi reflects long-standing practices of speakers of smaller languages in Western Arnhem land. Multilingualism seems to be tied to the maintenance of small languages such as Hmong in a quite specific way. This is quite explicit. Same thing uh, from uh, Kobina uh, in an article, in a, in a contribution he made it to a volume that I and Jeff Good edited that is called African Multilingualisms. So uh, he worked in Senegal. Uh, so multilingualism in the crossroads area, which is this lower Casavans area, is a correlate of multiple identities and thus a strategic necessity. The layered character of fluid identities protects small languages from extinction by allocating them a niche where they have a particular function in local context such as in religious contexts that create connections to the ancestors and reiterate land rights. Here too, I don't think there is any need to, to further comment this. And even just looking at numbers. So this is the, in this, this is the table that uh, Jeff and I published uh, in 2011 <clears throat> about the population. So the speaker population of the many uh, varieties of the languages spoken in Lower Fungo. This is the, the since each variety or each language is um, named after the village in which it is called, basically 
uh, and there is this one-to-one -one, um, ideology, ideological uh, assumption, ideological trait uh, locally that in in each village there is a language. Okay, then linguists may identify varieties of dialects, you know, because they're not too uh, distinct uh, from each other. But start, I mean, from from the local perspective, uh, they're just different languages. Okay, so uh, I'm saying all this because uh, in order to evaluate the speaker population of a given variety or given language, we concentrated on how many people were living in one village. So the village population equated, the, uh, say, the variety uh, population, variety speaker population. So these are uh, population figures for the different villages and for different. Uh, uh, for all the different villages. Um, then over the years, we, uh, and also thanks to the help of Rachel and other uh, students, um, administ so we, we carried out multiple surveys uh, concerning multilingualism. And so at a very rough calculation, uh, considering that we have surveyed more or less 2.3, 2.5%, I mean, more than 2% of the population of, of the area, Taking the proportions of the languages that people reported to be able to speak, uh, we get this speaker population for each variety. So instead of 600 or 800 people for Abar, Abar is a central village, is 7,000 speakers. Uh, other, this Bia, for instance, is a very tiny village, uh, may amount to 1,000 speakers. Uh, and so on and so forth. So that the total population is in fact 41,000 instead of between 10 and 14,000. Okay, this is a nice multiplier effect on speaker population. And this is also, I mean, this must, should be considered at the level of what is the impact of this kind of multilingualism on uh, language maintenance. And finally, in fact, this, uh, so these forms of uh, small-scale multilingualism are endangered uh, themselves. So sociolinguistic contexts are more fragile than lexicogrammatical codes, and therefore intrinsically more endangered. It is these contexts that will disappear first as smaller communities become transformed by contact with larger ones. Significant lexical data can be collected from even a single rememberer but documenting a, language, a language's sociolinguistic context requires an active speech community. So, all the more urgent to document so the, the small scale multilingualism, it looks like. And uh, so, this is where we should have Rachel's presentation, but I'm unable to see whether she's here. Jacob, can you see? Is she is she connected? Um, I don't see her name in the list. Uh, she could be this code the seven R M U Z D. But uh, I'm sorry for the interruption, but I'm not sure that she's there. Hmm. I don't know if in the meantime there are questions we uh, maybe I can I can try to answer can I ask uh, a very basic question sure definitely. so in the situation of diglossia or triglossia where there are different languages in the domain theory is the hierarchy of domains kind of the same for each language or is it different depending on the on the language or the community you mean um, so the, the the pattern is always the same so there is some the, the the idea is that there must be a hierarchy okay so that is the basic principle um then um uh, maybe i didn't i didn't quite get your your question so i'm just sort of wondering to, if it's like you see a, a pattern of um like the l languages would go to kind of the same domains across different oh domains. yes yeah sure definitely i'm sorry yes so um, you know that perspective 
uh, that, by the way, is uh, clearly captured by, uh, for those who are familiar with that, with Eckert's uh, three wave of uh, variationist social linguistics model. So that is an, an external model of society. So uh, that is the approach that is materialized in diglossa theory. And um, mm, this means that since they observed that usually it's in the home that the low language is used, then the assumption will be that the L language is always spoken in home uh, domains uh, or at the reverse, state institutions uh, or the, the media. Or, so the, the basic assumption is that um, there is there's always more or less a reproduction of what we have seen in global North societies. Okay, so very broadly. Then there are many other, so there are, um, uh, I, I realize I may risk giving a, a misleading impression of uh, the glossary theory. I'm just stressing, say, the limits. Okay, then in fact, uh, if it has become a research paradigm, uh, I mean, the, there is a reason it works in many, many cases, but it, it doesn't work ev everywhere and uh, every time. Okay, so apparently we don't have, uh, no. So she says that she's trying, but... Uh, okay, I will try to do it myself very quickly. Uh, I should stop sharing this and get here. Okay, just a second. If there are any questions, um, please feel free to raise your hand, uh, the virtual hand, and we can address them during the presentation. So here we have an example that is just a way we, we selected that uh, only to, to Hi, add. Hi, Jacob. Hi, Pierre. Hi, Rachel. I joined audio because if it's video, it's just going to go off. Okay, it's been sure. going on and off. Great to hear you. So yes. it's just audio. Okay. Yes, you can. You if can you can go hear on. me. Can yes, you? we can. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. So this is. This is an, an, an excerpt of uh, a speech of a multilingual speaker, which uh, we documented, whose name is there, you can see John Cho. So this is just an excerpt uh, uh, showing how multilingualism, the kind of multilingualism we document, small scale multilingualism is not likely to endanger um, so to speak, small languages. So you would see that um, in this excerpt, one multilingual speaker within a short time would use multiple languages with um, several people. He uses multiple languages depending on his interlocutor. So the first table you would sh shows the speaker, the multilingual speaker, John Cho. You would see his repertoire so he's freely multilingual. He can speak Misong, Mundabli, Mbufang, Bia, Munken, Abba, Mashi, all languages of lower Fungum. And um, as um, Pierre's presentation was going on, you saw some of the some of these languages are small languages. Um, um, Fidelis on his part can speak uh, Mundabli, Bia, and Mashi. These are the languages um, they share the two interlocutors share. So they could use any of these languages. They could use Mundabli, Bia, or Mashi. But um, from this discussion, you would see from John Cho here. So John Cho and Fidelis. John Cho chooses to use the um, first language, let me call it that, first language of his interlocutor, which is Mundabli. So he doesn't use, um, any of the languages he knows, including Cameroon and Pidgin English, which both speakers share. Um, so he, with, with Fidelis, he uses Fidelis' um, first language. Then he moves to another speaker, 
Shortly after that, in the same meeting, he moves to another speaker, he moves to Nadesh. So John Cho, the multilingual speaker, is now talk, speaking in Bu with Nadesh. He has left Mundabli, he's now speaking with uh, another uh, person from another village. So Fidelis was from Mundabli, Nadesh is from Bu. John, uh, John Cho is using Bu. He would go to a third speaker. If you see his conversation, um, I am trying to rush before the connection fails me. You would see, you would, we have excerpts of his conversation here. You would see the conversation in, in, in boom. So, um, it's not stable no. for me to read. Okay. okay. What we can see now is his encounter with the third speaker. All right. What we can see now is his encounter with a third speaker, and he's using a third language. So in with this speaker, this speaker is from a different village, so a third village called Fang. So he's using Fang, the L1 of that speaker. So John Cho alone, a multilingual speaker within a short space of time, has used the language or the varieties that his interlocutors speak representing the villages in which they come from. So um, you you can see the conversations he's holding, he's holding with them. You would see, worthy of note it is that they share other languages. You would see from table three, they share Misong, they share Fang. So he could, um, John Cho could use Misong with, with Mami Me, with a speaker, but he chooses to represent himself as part of the village from where Mami Be is from, which is Fang. So you would see that this multilingual speaker, one person promotes, uh, instead of endangering all of these languages. So in a short while, you can find a multilingual speaker who would use several languages representing himself or uh, showing himself similar to um, his interlocutors. I wonder if you can still hear me. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. But I cannot see the screen, so back to you, Pierre. Thank you. Okay. So before we move on, is, are there any questions? Jago, I, I can't see. None in the chat, so uh, as far as I've seen. Okay. Um, okay. There were a couple of comments. Uh -huh. I think earlier Kira said, there are definite examples in the Pacific Northwest of North America. We have a group of seven converging language families and trade routes highly influence multilingual practices even after contact. So. Okay, perfect, great. Um, all right, so we can go ahead and uh, start talking about how to how we are documenting these forms of multilingualism. <clears throat> so first of all, how uh, do, do we deal with speech data? Uh, as you may have seen in uh, uh, Rachel's example, um, uh, well, if if I if I uh, if I tell you that these are tonal languages, then you will realize, because th those languages have tones, the tones here are not represented. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and then I will, I will tell you more. Um, so when we uh, use, when, when we uh, work on, on speech data, uh, our mm, say the, the, the normal expectation uh, for, for a language documenter <clears throat> is to uh, try and understand what people mean uh, by saying what they what they say. In this case, we have two different, uh, say, levels uh, of meaning. There is, say, the, the meaning that is understandable through and, uh, grammar and lexicon, and then there is another meaning, another meaning that is, uh, say, for now, let's call it uh, that is uh, encoded through shared culture. But uh, so in, usually, this is 
what is uh, at the center of a language documentation uh, project, right? In emphasis is uh, at this level of meaning. And one would expect to find this kind of transcriptions with some glossing, either a bit, uh, say, simplified or more uh, specialistic, but this is what one would expect. And this is what we would call linguistic ad adequacy. So that uh, the corpus should be adequate in order to allow linguists to work on it and to do glossing and any kind of grammatical descriptions and lexicographic uh, reasoning and analysis and so on and so forth. But this is not what is uh, actually uh, what, what we do. Why is that so? So why not linguistic adequacy? Can you imagine doing phonological translations and interlinear glossing for a number of under-researched languages? I mean, it would take not forever, more than that. Uh, and also, uh, many people working a lot of time. I mean, it would be. I mean, it would be really nice, uh, but it's completely out of reach, in fact. But uh, in fact, uh, there is another key uh, aspect to consider: is that uh, linguistic adequacy is quite irrelevant for documenting multilingual practices at the level of. So, if we understand multilingual practices as ways to um, create and convey meanings, okay? Um, so, because what do we do when we go uh, to the field? We 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 record, we record, then we transcribe, and we translate. We can say we could say that we go from signals to signs to meanings, and. If we don't have meanings, if you think of it, it can hardly be uh, called a documentation. So if, imagine, so uh, just recording uh, someone speaking and then making the uh, recording available to others is not a documentation, right? I mean, that is just recording. If we transcribe what, uh, what we have recorded, well, it starts being something usable, but the problem is actually the usability of, uh, of, of, of a work. So if it is, uh, say, usable by some specific, say, categories of people, uh, like linguists or communities or sociolinguists or historians, so depending on, on who uh, you think uh, is in the audience, uh, then this is how you will transcribe and you will uh, translate and you will make it uh, make the meanings accessible to others who are not those you have recorded uh, so the most common uh, ways uh, to go about the, this process is to provide a translation in a major language and then I, I just put grammatical meanings just to to mean I mean, all the morphemes and you know, the things that may uh, further um, provide access to the meanings that are in the transcription that we have produced. Um, and how do we do that? We do that by knowing, developing a knowledge of lexicon, then doing phonological transcription and doing glossing. So we consider language as a code, okay? And this is a way to look at linguistic adequacy. So it is through developing, so once we develop this, we are able to do this, okay? So in the case of multilingualism, um, we are not very much um, concerned with how the grammar and the lexicon of a given language, uh, so in, in, not in understanding the mechanisms that are in the grammar and in the lexicon of a, of a given language so that we can account for a given meaning that we get in a translation, okay? That is the semantic or referential meaning. So the meaning that is produced by, by ling linguistic signs in, when they are symbols, when they are in a code, when, when in order to understand the meaning of, uh, of something, you need to understand the code 
and the code is grammar and lexicon. So in the case of the study of multilingualism, we are more concerned about the production of a different meaning, that is the indexical meaning, social indexical meaning, that is not implied in any of the, of the morphemes here, is just the very fact of being in a language or in another language that conveys a certain meaning, that is indexical, is not semantic or referential. Uh, so when instead of grammatical meanings, we have social meanings, everything changes. So we no longer, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm not saying that we should not uh, produce uh, interlinear glossing or we should not do phonological transcription. I'm just saying that this is not priority. This is no longer priority. Um, so we're, because we are not considering language as a code. We don't need to understand language in order to decode symbols. Okay, we are doing a different, a very different work. Because we need to make uh, it possible for users of a documentation to access the indexical space of a community. And this is sociolinguistic adequacy. Now, I, I guess that, so um, uh, it, I think it's important that uh, we try to introduce some terminology uh, in this workshop because, you know, as far as I know, there are there haven't been structured attempts at describing what this kind of work in the in document in language documentation uh, may look like or how it should be done, and, and so we lack also some key terms to refer to items of our work of processes in our work. So we don't have the equivalent of grammar and lexicon for what is not the the the. the, the the symbol functionality of, of, of the of linguistic science, but as, as I will now show to you. So we, we need some new terms to speak about what to do. So what the heck is indexical space? Uh, so a possible uh, definition is the ideal universe of all the possible meanings that can be obtained using language indexically, according to the rules of use that are shared by members of a given speech community. As with most other descriptions available, I mean, I don't like the <laughs> definitions. Um, it tells very, I mean, I, I think quite little. The, the, the important thing here is to understand that as we uh, refer, uh, let's be aware of the fact that whenever we, uh, for instance, uh, talk about grammar on, or lexicon, we think we, we possess something with that, uh, uh, that they have a limit. In fact, they, they don't because languages continue to change. So when they, are, they too are ideal universes of items to, to select or of, of processes of, of um, change of uh, linguistic uh, science, uh, linguistic expressions. This is the same for the indexical, uh, the production of indexical meaning. So we have an ideal universe of things that can be meant using linguistic science as indices, okay? And this is the indexical space. Why do we need that? Because, so, most of the times, if not always, when we speak in real world, we produce both indexical meanings and semantic or referential meanings. Just think of the, your linguistic choices over the past 24 hours, how many times you selected a, a word instead of another word, a way to pronounce a word instead of a, another way to pronounce a word, or you selected a, a, a certain variety or a, a certain language mm, with, while, while you were speaking with a person with, with whom you could have also used another language. So those are always choices that have to do with the production of indexical meaning, okay? But we don't have specific markers for indexical meanings. They are just there when we use the language. So this is called the multiple functionality of linguistic science, okay? So the semantic or referential meaning is obtained when we go from the sign to the meaning through the code, as I said, you know, grammar and lexicon. Indexical meaning, and this, that is the symbol. Indexical meaning is obtained when uh, the, the relationship between the sign and the meaning 
is in the context. So the, the, the sign gets a meaning through context, whereas the symbol gets uh, meaning through code. Okay, so that is an index. And in fact, instead of talking about context, we should say contexts, okay? And now I'm telling you why. So the indexical space is made in fact uh, of two, oh, I'm sorry, uh, two main contexts. So the situational context and the extra situational context. Situational context is just this, the context of the interaction. And this is, for instance, very clear when we have to account for the meaning of index of um, the ethics, this, that, or yesterday, or tomorrow. Um, so those are the, the meaning of, of those words that are signs um, depends on the actual situation, on where or when the person is speaking. Then there is, uh, there is also the extra situational context, that is everything that informs my, say, my, my view. And uh, so this can be sociopolitical organization, available identities, uh, micro and macro scenarios, language ecologies, culture. Okay, so this is really big. I mean, there is a lot. It, 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 one, one may wonder, so you, you mean that uh, in order to, to work on a small scale multilingualism, what should know all of these things? So that it would be impossible, no? In order to map the indexical meaning that is obtained when one chooses a, a, a certain language over another language. No, we need a way to probe into, into the indexical space. And one model is what diglossia theory uh, suggests. No, I mean, we have domains and we have languages. So it, it would be sufficient to ask someone, uh, what do you speak in this domain or in this other domain? Like, most of the currently used questionnaires of multilingualism that are based on domains. Okay, so they, they are meant to explore the indexical space by asking questions about domains because they are built on the diglossia theory that says that the indexical, they, they, don't, they don't use the expression indexical space. This is my, my, my term, but uh, that the indexical space can be Mm, say uh, probed with the, the, I mean can be can be understood in its main uh, features by subdividing the social linguistic space into domains and then you ask people what do you speak in uh, high school with the teacher or at the post office or at your workplace and you will get the index how people produce indexical meanings but this is not what happens in small scale multilingualism as we said at the beginning, the glossia theory in domains don't work. So we need this other approach. And here I, so this is mm, to, to go ahead, we can build on recent findings from settings of small scale multilingualism. And this is, this uh, have to do with the, so what we have learned about the representation of personal identity in uh, small scale multilingualism settings. Um, first of all, let's try to be aware of another implicit feature of the Glossia theory. The Glossia theory, I just I already uh, told you many times what, what I what, uh, so what my my view on, on the Glossia theory and the fact that the, so the main assum the assumptions that it has. One of the assumptions that it has, but has really practically never been considered, is that. Uh, it um, um, identifies, it uh, considers personal identity as being of this kind. If you use the, say, black language, you will be, you, you can become a member of the black group, where black is not uh, something that is created by actual relations among people, but it is an abstract type, meaning, imagine, for instance, uh, uh, you have to speak uh, polite English when you go to the university. So by doing that, the, the main concern 
is to look like an educated and relatively, say, mid-high status or whatever other feature that you want to add. But you are not manifesting a personal relationship with anyone. It's just, I am part of, I am that type of person, okay? So being a certain type of person, that is the, the, the framework for identity construction that is uh, just at the core of the Deglossia theory. And in fact, if you think uh, through it, is at the core of whatever we, we say and think, especially now that we have social media, uh, through which we are always uh, kind of stimulated to to be one or the other type of person. We want to be a progressive-minded, a conservative-minded, a religious person. Uh, you know, the, those are pressures to become types of people. So the Glossier theory says if you use the black language, you will be like uh, you will be in the group of uh, the black. Then if you use the reddish language, you will become uh, the, of the group of the red. And if you use the purple uh, language, you will become um, of the purple type. So, but what kind of identity is this? This is a categorical identification. Okay, so what that, and the categorical means abstract. So there is an abstraction and there are features that if you, if you use the language, you will call up all the other features that are come with the package of that language. But this is not what, what we've seen uh, in Lower Fungum, or at least only for the, uh, for the, basically only for English. For the other languages, it's quite different. So uh, one may choose language A to, to represent that uh, the person is in relation with someone else, with some, specific, with some concrete real person, not an idea, just a real person. And by so doing, it connects, so this connects the person to a certain network. And when it, uh, the person uh, chooses the lang language B, it activates a different network. I mean, in reality, everyone is connected with everyone else. There is a number, there are many networks that are also, um, so that surface also in language uh, that that go everywhere. There's a very dense web of relationship. But by using language, there is this kind of illusionary division, subdivision, clarity. So I'm affiliating myself with you. And by so doing, I'm stressing the fact that I am, for instance, uh, the son of my mother, because my mother is your relative. Whereas if I speak in the other language, I will be stressing my paternal uh, kinship uh, side, say, or you say, one may have multiple uh, networks, and in each network, a given position. What kind of identity is this? This is relational identification. So there are no, when someone chooses to use language A, there are no other features so it's not the language A is the language of the conservative minded or of the progressive minded or the wealthy or the high status, prestige, whatever. There are no other features. It's just being part of a real group. So this means that, so uh, just to get to, to what to do. So corpora aimed at sociolinguistic adequacy like the ones that we we are we are collecting should include data that, that allow users to map speakers position in diverse networks that is the, the the idea is to try to understand what are the available relational identities to someone so this means that question questionnaires or interviews so there must be an interview component in the corpus and the interviews should be focused on people's relationships, not on domains of language use. Okay, so this is very different from what has been done in the overwhelming majority of the stud of studies on multilingualism. And um, and I think it, it also requires a, cer a certain uh, say. The, I remember when I when I realized that this was the case, I, I, I nearly heard a click in my brain 
So because opening the relational part of identity opens up a very different way of looking at things from what as I, I mean, I'm, a, I'm Italian, I was born here, raised here, uh, I studied here in the US. So um, I am a global northern. For me, it was a revelation to really put relationships at the core of a study of this kind. Then uh, another thing to do is to map the communities shared meta pragmatics. So what people, uh, so the kind of the rules of use. So what you know that you obtain in reality if you if you choose a certain language. Okay, so that is meta pragmatics. And this is language ideologies basically. So uh, and how do you study? How do you document language ideologies through interviews, observation, and ethnographic literature? And, uh, and then uh, also important is to map the situational context in which the recorded interaction takes place. This means that you, you need some kind of thick description of the context of interaction that you can get only when you work a lot with, the, with your um, consultants, with your, your collaborators. And now if Rachel is there, are you there Rachel? Yes, I am. I'm here. Okay, here. great. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, sounds I good. Can. You can you can go ahead. Okay, so this part is about. Okay, you. So this part is about how to document multilingualism is basically, I'm basically sharing with you my experience or what I, how I went about documenting uh, or how we've been working in the project um, with Pierre and Jeff. Okay, so how do you document multilingualism? The first step is to conduct a social linguistic interview. First, what is a social linguistic interview? Uh, it's a well-prepared discussion. I don't want to call it an interview so that it doesn't sound like a rigid, a formal question and answer um, session. So it's a well-prepared discussion based on a series of structured set of questions. So this is very important. It's a very important step and it is a prerequisite for recording natural conversations. So before we record natural conversations, natural speeches, spontaneous speeches of individuals, of consultants, it is important, it is primordial that we co conduct a sociolinguistic interview. So, so because this sociolinguistic interview is unstructured, hence the well-prepared discussion instead of a formal interview, interview, because it is unstructured, one requires an interview guide. In our project, we, we call the interview guide the social linguistic interview guide is sleek. May I have the next slide? Yes. Okay. So we call them the sleek. So our social linguistic interview guides are basically made up of four sections. So we have the first section, which is the basic metadata of the recording. It has to do with the date the time, the place where the recording is about to take place, uh, the name of the researcher, like the, the, the interviewer, and then the name of the file, just basic information about the recording. So that's what falls under basic metadata of the recording. Then we go to the crux, which has to do with the biography and networks. Uh, just after that, we have self-reported multilingual repertoires and self-reported language um, usage patterns, which I think will be explained in the following slide. So for biography and networks, our um, SLEEG have about 40 questions. So the first six questions are about demographic details, where we ask about the age, the gender, the place of birth, the residence of the consultants. Then we now move to ask about their names. 
And uh, interestingly, in lower fungo, names are quite complex. So we ask the names that the consultants bear, including those that are not shown in the ID, but which is of extreme importance to lower fungo. So they have names that are shown on their official documents. Generally, those names are given only by your father or the paternal families. Then they have they also have names that are given by the their mother or the maternal families. So all of these names are very important uh, in the context of lower fungo, are very important to understand multilingualism in lower fungo. So we take note of this. Then we also take note of the residence of the consultant over time. So here we ask questions like, where were you between the ages of zero and 10? Where were you between the ages of 10 to 20? Uh, this also has a bearing on the language choice on, 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 of the, on the language choice of the consultant. Next, we have the formal education. Where did you go to school? Um, up to what level did you go to school? So after that, we have family relationships and then um, additional relationships. For the last two, which are of utmost importance, we would see them elaborately uh, in the next slide. So for the question, questions on from 20 to 36 that have to do with family relationships, which are of utmost importance to understand and to document a multilingualism in lower fungo. We ask questions about the father, the mother, the grandparents, the great grandparents of the consultants. You can see a, a sample questionnaire here. So for question 20, we could have uh, no, question 21, oh, where has your father spent his life? So you would list the, the, the villages where your father has spent his life. Maybe question 28, where did your mother's mother come from? You have to, we have to collect the village and the quarter. So in this question, in this um, interview guide, question 28, you would see the quarter is, the village name is Bu, the quarter is Fengbe, all of these details, uh, all of these intricate details are of utmost importance when to understand multilingualism, to understand the dynamics of language use in lower fungo. And so we do not only ask about the family members, we also have to ask about their spouses. So that is what we mean by family relationships. So in the next step, the next slide. So in the next slide, the next slide continues with spouse and the, 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 the family of the spouse and all of that and the education of the spouse as well. So then we have additional relationship. For additional relationship, we mean um, in, um, things like uh, people like best, best friends and friends. And so we would ask them, where does your best friend come from? That's question 37. We we'll ask them, uh, that also falls under other networks. So other networks from um, the blood relationship, from the immediate family and spouse. So other networks. So ask them questions like, where does your best friend best friend come from? We have to collect the village name and the quarter. So sometimes they may tend to say, um, I don't have best friends. My best, my best friends are my brothers and sisters from the village or something like that. And then um, for cultural commitments, this is very intricate and um, has to do with the realities of lower fungo. Um, I understand it much better because it's not too far from my reality. We, we try to elicit information about the commitments, the cultural commitments that a consultant has to do. For example, Jangi, and Jangi it's, a, it's an informal meeting, uh, an informal financial savings meeting so we try to ask the kind of meetings they attend, in which villages they attend such meetings. And those meetings, do they um, comprise people from diverse villages or just a particular village? Uh, we ask them if they have particular dance group, just some particular cul cultural relevant events which they are part of, all of which will condition the languages they use and must be documented. Okay, next slide. All right, so um, once we've collected the information about the networks, then we collect information about 
the self-reported multilingual repertoires of the consultant. So in this section, we collect all the li a list of all the languages and the varieties that the, com the consultant is competent in. So um, in this section, we go, uh, we behave, we, we try to listen to the consultants and give them an open hand and we listen to what counts for them as a language. In Lower Fungum, for example, there are 13 villages. So for linguists, linguists may say there are seven to eight distinct languages in Lower Fungum, but the villagers may say that they have each, each 13 of each of the 13 village has um, its own language. So they will say they have 13 languages. So it is important for us to consider that point. So um, as long as the consultant has the name of a particular code they are using, as long as they believe that it is different from another one, even if it's just a change in tone, a change in vowel or, con or consonant, which to a linguist it's clear that it's, this is a variety of another language, it's important that we consider that it, to consider the difference that the speaker makes because this is what guides their choice. This is what guides um, their, 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 their language use. So this notion reveals a lot about their indexical space. And so we, we cannot throw it away or brush it aside like it's just a variety. No, if for them it's another language, then we have to consider it that way. All right, next slide, please. So moving from the self-reported um, rep repertoire, we, we land on self-reported language usage patterns. So in this section, we have questions that elicit um, how the consultants know those languages. Because um, in the um, in, in the previous section, we have to we have to have the consultants list all the languages they know. So in this section, questions under section four have to uh, elicit information about how they came about knowing all of these languages. That's what we call acquisition path. So how did they learn these languages? Sometimes they would say, um, my, my, my great grandfather was from another village and my father attended, um, remember what I said about Jangi meetings, attended meetings in that village. And when I went there, the meetings were only in that particular language and people spoke to me only in that particular language. So I learned it. Some people may say, I married from that village and so I lived there or I visited from there from time to time and so I learned the language. You could also say education. Some of those villages don't have schools, so they could go to school. The consultant may have gone to school in another village and there, as they are mixed in a classroom, they will pick up other languages. So how do they learn these languages? The questions from here elicited that. Then um, we get to get insight into the belief of of the speaker on how the community used the language. So now that they have told us the languages they use and how they learn them, we are interested to know how they use them. So they have to first of all tell us how they use those languages. So we would ask them questions like, would you use language X with your late parent? For example, I have a consultant, we have a consultant in one of our projects who could speak all the languages of Lower Fungum, so to speak, all the 13 likes of Lower Fungum. Her mother could speak most of the likes of Lower Fungum as well. Her mother is late. So I could ask her, if you are discussing with your mother, can you use language A to discuss with? If you want B, it just happens that you are overwhelmed with life situations. And then you want to say something to your mom, which is typical of um, this part of the world. Would you use this language? So she could say, she would say something like, no, that's not the language she prefers. That's not the language she brought us up with. So I would not use the language. And so I, I could ask her, um, is it needful to use language X with your friend from another village? And they would go, oh, yes. Oh, yes. When I use her language, she feels like we are one, like I'm from her tribe. So that is why we are friends. And so with, with questions from this section, we get to know from the consultants how their languages should be used. And so what they have noted is that in this section, again, like um, Pierre Paolo has said, we do not ask questions pertaining to domains. We do not say, when you're in church, which language would you use? Or in a, maybe a political gathering, what language would you use? So we are looking at uh, language use 
uh, as far as creating relationships are concerned. Okay, next slide, please. So um, this is uh, uh, just for an illustration. This is a, a picture of uh, me and one of my consultants when I was collecting what I have just described, the sociolinguistic interviews. So um, somewhere on my lab, you would see piece, um, some papers. So that those are my sleeps. And like you see, it doesn't look like a formal interview. And somewhere on you would see something like a gallon, see something like a gallon here, here, and then you see a, an audio recorder. But right in front of us was a video camera. So for to, to collect data, we used a video camera. We used an, an audio recorder as well. <clears throat> so it was important for us to use a video camera because of contextual factors which are relevant to understand language use. So contextual factors, all of those, all of maybe the gestures of the consultant, the behavior of a consultant. I could go to a consultant and the consultant is maybe seated close to somebody, her husband, her father, and she's not very free and she keeps throwing a certain kind of look and the camera, the, the, the video recorder would capture that. And I would see that when I am um, analyzing. So I would give priority or give importance, not only to the audio recorder, but also to the to video recording. Okay. May I have the next slide? Yep. All right. Can you see that? Um, that was it for step one. All of that. Yes, please. All of that was step one. All of that had to do with um, um, the sociolinguistic interview sociolinguistic interviews now that we have the sociolinguistic interviews we need to know we need to record an actual language use so to record the actual language use we have a hanging microphone so we the consultants for our research wore a lavalier microphone on their shirt and attached the recorder to their belt at the beginning we had them we saw the bag that they wore like a necklace and placed the recorder inside. But you know, as they kept, as they, as they walked, they, they, the, the, the recorder kept swaying left and right, and it picked up some noise that were too loud. Our aim was when we saw the back and they wore the consultant, um, the recorder as a necklace, was for that the recorder to be obvious to all of those present that they have, they have been recorded but that proved a little difficult. So we had this lavalier microphone and had the, the consultants pin it on their shirt, the microphone on their shirt and the recorder on their belt. The recorder and the mic hung visibly such that everyone could see them. And then when we did that, when we would have them wear the recorder, after setting parameters, which are important for metadata, such as time and date and volume, we would retire and the consultant will go about their daily activities in our absence. But we have an agreement that you're recording for three hours, three hours, 30 minutes or less. Then also we said, uh, we're meeting here somewhere and then we we'll collect the mic and the recorder. So the mic allowed um, the recording to be obviously done. The mic allowed the consultant to be able to go about their daily activities. And um, what they have not, very important, we also told the record uh, consultant that the, the recordings belong to them. So I, I would generally say, I don't understand your language. So when giving me this, when returning the mic, if you happen to have gone into a conversation somewhere and recorded something that you think that is sensitive and you want me to, to delete it, I'm going to wear a very broad smile on my face and delete it. And then we'll start afresh. If there are parts that you you don't want us you don't want us to have access to, then we'll delete it. So we gave um, the full control of the recording to the consultant, and they told to so that they tell us what to which part to 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 translate and transcribe. Okay, next slide, please. So. After, after after we've had our recording, 
we need to put it in text form. To do that, we use Elan. Elan allows us to add a notation on either the video or the audio recording. So for uh, an, an Elan file, an Elan file will generally comprise maybe um, multiple tiers. So for the tiers would have, the tiers have to show the language the consultant used, the speaker, the interlocutor, the actual conversation in the local language, a free translation into English, and then other interactants, topic, additional metadata or comments. I really feel like I should emphasize on other interactants. So the 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 Elan should have should strive strive to contain as many interactants as possible because this is highly relevant. So aside the topic, additional metadata, for example, that you, you could put and other comments like um, explaining the language use or the it, it, there was a bird chirping around or the loud noise was due to the felling of some trees or something, we, it's important that there are several interactants. I will show you what I mean by tiers containing several interactants in the next slide. All right, this is the next slide. So this is an example of one of our Elan files. So you would see interactants, interactants here, we have two interactants, Nto and Iman from Bu. Then the topic they're discussing, you would see it's phone. Then I have a main speaker. The main speaker there you would see is Nto, the language name is Misong, and then the exact words of the consultant in the Misong, one of the languages of Lower Fungom, then a free translation. How are you? You have to go with my phone. It has a small problem. Then I have notes. Do is using Miso with a man from Bu. He says that uh, a man understands Miso, plus he's younger than he is. He poses no problem if he uses this language with a man. These are additional notes which I have, add, um, which are relevant and which I have added. But if you see um, here, I have Temporal participant one. So I have temporal participant one aside the main speaker. Temporal participant one, we would see, then language name, transcription, notes, English translation. Then beneath we have temporal participant two. So this Elan file can have as many temporal participants, as many interactants as possible so that we know those who were in who were in the uh, conversation, uh, would, would say anything in the conversation, conversation at all. Okay. All right, last step. Uh, from the notes we have, those are social linguistic annotation, the notes from the previous slides, which I, 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 I talked about explaining why the consultant used a particular language with a particular interlocutor, saying that he was his junior and he would not mind. So those are social linguistic annotations which I have added to the land file based on my ethnographic observation, because we have lived and worked in that area for a long time, and based on the speaker's self-reports. So from the self-reports, they said, this language is, I cannot use this language with my elder from that particular village. I can use this language with my relative of this day. So from their self-report, I am able to add sociolinguistic annotations to Elan files. Then we have ethnographic and uh, observation for sociolinguistic complexity. So um, to be able to add sociolinguistic annotation, ethnographic observations are of crucial importance because there are certain things that consultants, mean, phenomena that consultants may not be able to explain in an interview, but because you've seen it, you can understand it and maybe ask them and they'll be ready to answer. So to understand the complexities and the intricacies of multilingualism or language use and ethnographic observation is of crucial importance. Um, it would reveal the parallel of what people do and what they say they do in their self reports. So aside collecting the, the recordings, we must also do ethnographic observation because they work hand in hand 
with our recording. We'll be able to analyze or understand language use or document language use better with ethnographic observation. I think that's it, Pierre. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, Rachel. And now uh, I realize, oh, I'm sorry. I realize we are very close to the end of the workshop. And I wonder if, uh, so I had some final questions. Uh, so just to show the different, uh, so the amount of linguistic versus sociolinguistic adequacy. So just to see what we do less uh, and more in the different approaches. Then I have some, some general questions uh, so if this approach is alternative to classical monolingual uh, language documentation, no. Uh, the problem is just that, that the single researchers cannot do both at the same time, and but doing the two approaches might, benef might be beneficial to both. In a, um, so start with one and then continue with the other approach with, with different people, that would be perfect. Uh, do communities care about the multilingualism, the documentation of multilingualism? I would say not very much, at least at, at the beginning in my, in my experience. Uh, this is because on the surface, it seems to counter language maintenance, no? as we said at the very beginning. Uh, but uh, we've, what we've seen is that this kind of work may provide important stimuli for self-reflexivity and awareness in speakers of endangered languages about the role of the different languages that they have in their repertoires. And this is probably the one one of the most interesting aspects to to discuss with the PhD students who do language documentation, uh, because this kind of work may not be, uh, I mean, actually within I mean, could, could accommodated easily in a in a PhD program in language documentation, and uh, and then. Of course, there, also this is something that can be discussed. So ways to, to put together the two approaches. So if one started with doing a normal language documentation, can some uh, components of multilingual documentation be integrated? Sure. Uh, the most important thing is to collect information about speakers, as Rachel has uh, highlighted. And then there are also some articles that are, going, that are being published, which uh, will probably help uh, in this regard. And this is it. And I'm sorry that we left so little time for discussion. It was probably too long. And there are a few questions in the chat we might be able to get to in the last couple of minutes. Um, okay. From Hannah, uh, I'll just read it unless you want to unmute. But Hannah asked, do you think that Perhaps the sociological circumstances of small scale multilingualism extend past our Western current understanding of social interactions. It seems to transcend current accepted universalist theories. Hmm. Hey, wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, I mean, uh, the, the quick answer is I think so. <laughs> I don't know how, how to best expand this in the one minute, but uh, yeah. yeah. And if I there are discussions um, that, if, there, if people want to keep having these discussions, there's the Zoom lounge that is open during the whole conference and people can meet anytime in there. And there are breakout rooms where you can meet with individual people or as groups. Um, it looks like the time is about up. So sorry, we didn't get to the questions at the end, but yeah. Thank you, mahalo to everyone for coming, and thank you, Pierpaolo and Rachel, for the awesome uh, workshop. Thank you so much, and sorry again. I will save the chat so that in case I will meet someone well, in the social you. lounge. Of okay. okay.